this is an injustice that these stories are not known and that we have populations of Zambians and Africans who think that women, number one, did not contribute much or women are an oppressed population in Africa. And in fact, you know, when you thought about it more, we're like, we're, we're actually, if we look at our lives historically, we were much better off than, than the West who introduced actually this patriarchy that we now call our own. She's the only one. Salam and hello everyone. My name is Lily Bakala Piper, and as always, I am so honored that you have tuned in to Salam and Hello. This month, as you know, we are celebrating women, their work, their impact, their stories, and the way that we have changed and shaped culture and the world really since the beginning of time. Today's guest is one of those culture shapers. Recently at the Africa Media Festival, I had a chance to meet some incredible thinkers and creators, and Samba Yonga was one of those people who just stood out amongst the crowd of many. Samba is an award-winning journalist, communication specialist, and culture curator. She's also the co-founder of the Women's History Museum of Zambia. Isn't that amazing? I just love saying that, the Women's History Museum of Zambia. She co-founded this work in 2017 with a mandate to research and restore African indigenous narratives, knowledge, and living histories entirely 100% focused on women. And as we thought about the slate of stories we wanted to bring to you this Women's History Month and International Women's Day, we absolutely knew that Samba was somebody whose voice and story and work we wanted to hear more of and to share with each and every one of you. So welcome to the show with great honor, Samba Yonga. Samba, welcome to Salam and Hello. We are so delighted to have you with us. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for such a great introduction. Uh, it's only true. And, and Samba, before we go on, am I saying your name correctly? Because, you know, names are so powerful. I want to make sure that we're say, I'm saying it correct. Yes, Samba, that's correct. <laughs> okay. Ah, you added a little flavor to the Samba. Okay, so we'll make sure <laughs> to get the right accent on there. So Samba, tell us a little bit more. I mean, I've highlighted just in brief that you are a journalist and a storyteller, but but tell us, what is the Museum of Women's History and why was that work something that you have dedicated the last many years to creating? Hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I think it's a, it's a journey of revelations. I think that's the best way to describe why we decided to set up the Women's History Museum. Um, I had been working in the journalistic space for a number of years, maybe seven years. And I particularly worked in the international journalism space. I was an international correspondent. And uh, a lot of the time we would have to write articles on African stories. And as we know, the big attraction for international news stories is always these stories of destitution in Africa. And that just didn't sit well with me for the longest time because I straddled these two worlds where yes, these things were going on in Africa, but there's so much else happening in Africa that was incredible and amazing. And we needed our own platforms to document these stories, uh, to exhibit them, to disseminate them. And during this time, I was also meeting a lot with Mulenga Kapwepwe, who's a cultural heritage specialist here in Zambia. And she had documented these incredible stories of women who, when you studied and looked at the work they had done, actually impacted our contemporary lives. And I was like, it's, this is an injustice that these stories are not known and that we have populations of Zambians and Africans who think that women, number one, did not contribute much or women are an oppressed population in Africa. And in fact, you know, when you thought about it more, we're like, we're, we're actually, if we look at our lives historically, we were much better off than, than the West who introduced actually this patriarchy that we now call our own. Um, so that was part of the motivation of setting up the Women's History Museum as a way of countering some of these narratives and systems of knowledge that we had adopted and kind of like dismantling them and, and showing the world um, that 
they are counter narratives, but also showing Africans as well and giving them back a sense of identity and ownership. Because obviously mm. I, I talk about Zambia, but this, this, these are similar histories in all of Africa, I think, most parts of absolutely. Africa. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. So I've been, of course, reading and consuming your work the last few weeks, and I'm, you know, I'm struck by the, the fact that this museum is a digital product. Oh. It's something that all of us, no matter where we are, the diaspora or on the ground can access. But tell me a little bit more about your decision to make it a digital platform, as opposed to maybe trying to create a brick and mortar structure that people could walk into and experience these histories for themselves. Hmm. Yeah, I think there are several um, considerations uh, when it comes to that. I think the first and most important one was that we are living in a digital age and digital is accessible now everywhere and anywhere. And when we immediately mooted the idea for a museum, we knew that we wanted a brick and mortar museum, but we were not going to wait five years until we build it to start doing the work because we knew that this was an important message and important information and history that we needed to document like imminently. So we decided to go ahead and set it up as a digital space and then work you know, in tandem to uh, work towards a brick and mortar. The second reason is that you know, the digital age is, is, the Afri is for the African age. It's, it's now, it's what Africans are consuming, it's what young people are consuming. And that was a large consideration for uh, our demographic and target group. We wanted to take this information to young people as well so that they can interact with it, um, they can utilize it and they can consume it. And digital was the natural choice for that. And the third reason is that the concept of museums is actually not African. It's a very Westernized mm. idea, the whole building and the white box and putting things in a cabinet so people can look at it as things of curiosity. It's very much a Western, you know, Occident kind of uh, structure and system of knowledge. And we've been kind of interrogating that and unpacking that even as we are looking to build a museum because we we have acquired 60 acres of land. Outstanding, um, wow. Yeah, and we are kind of looking at creating this open space kind of um, experiential museum that will be very much rooted in the environment, in nature. So we've been really interrogating the idea of museums and museology, exhibition, exhibition spaces, and wanting them to root them closer to our own source communities, our own indigenous knowledge systems, because if you go to our own communities, there's, there's no such thing as a museum. You know, our we live our histories, they're Absolutely. living histories. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And and all the artifacts that were taken and 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 taken to the museums and institutions in the West, you know, they are from our communities. They are living histories that were just separated from us. So we've been really interrogating the whole idea of museum as a building. That's a pretty powerful idea. You know, there's so many experiences in the last few years that have been developed, you know, ideas like classrooms without walls or, you know, Medicine Sounds Frontier, this idea of removing limitations to how we learn and, and had not thought about that to museums as a Western concept and this idea that we should be interacting it with a very active, present uh, capacity, which is really quite powerful thought to be able to be engaging with it as also a modern concept, not just a exactly. historical one, but a living, breathing, current concept. But I want, I want to talk a little bit more about the digital piece. I, I was reading in oh. some of your work that one of your ways that you have kind of archived and researched is an effort to re digit digitally repatriate mm -hmm. some of this knowledge. Yeah. Tell me about that term, digital repatriation or digitally repatriating the history of Zambia. What does that mean to you? And, and why, again, does that seem to be the best path forward for your work? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the story. I was doing some uh, communications work in Sweden. Um, so a friend of mine, while I was there, she was like, um, I think you should go to the Ethnographic Museum of Stockholm. Um, there's an African curator there, he's, he's Black, 
uh, Jamaican origin, but he's doing incredible work for you know African history. So I went there. And while there, he was like, oh, uh, you know, by the way, we have got um, an artifact on display. It's from Zambia. So for me, I'm just like, Sweden, Sweden. and Zambia. Exactly. <laughs> I was just like, what's a Zambian artifact doing here? And then he took me to this thing. And it was, you know, it was, I think it was um, quite serendipitous. It was the costume of a masquerade dancer that usually is part of a traditional ceremony where I come from actually in the northwest of Zambia mm. and this is a ceremony that happens uh, for the boy initiates once they go through their rite of passage ceremony and they're circumcised and they come out and these masked uh, dancers and figures are representations of ancestors mm. who come during the the procession and the ceremony to teach the young men how to be men, how to you know uh, live life, how to look after their family, how to be leaders, and this this costume was just in this cabinet and it was just looking lifeless and and I'm like how did this come here, and then he went on to tell me this story of how Swedish um, ethnographers or explorers used to come on boats with the British. They would rent out space in British voyage ships and come okay. to Africa because they couldn't afford their own ships. And that's how you had like Scandinavian uh, explorers and ethnographers coming to Africa and collecting artifacts. And it went on um, to be that the museum had actually inherited a lot of these artifacts. And for Zambia, they had like 2000 uh, wow. objects and documents and photos, you know, they had, they had received from, you know, the children of these explorers after they had passed on. So they have in their collection, wow. this amazing, you know, set of artifacts. And this started the conversation of, uh, you know, how do we get this back to Zambia? Because first of all, if you can imagine, not even the Zambian museums board here in, in Zambia knew that there's artifacts in Sweden. They had no idea whatsoever. And that and museum some, had no relationship with the, the museum in Zambia. There wasn't a conversation about, by the way, we have this, no courtesy no. call or anything like that. Nothing, wow. nothing. Wow. None of that had ever happened. That only started when we actually decided that we would start a project where we digitally repatriate the artifacts and then eventually physically transition them back uh, to Zambia. And I mean, the whole, there's a huge debate, I'm sure you know, around the restitution of African objects back to their countries right. of origin, but there's so many layers around that. It's like, where will these objects go? How will they be kept? Should they even be kept? Who are the actual owners? You know, how Absolutely. do you, yeah, like how do you provide justice for the source communities? How do you extract new knowledge to make it contemporary? Because, you know, we always felt like we don't want the objects to come back just for the sake of coming back so that they can go back into a museum and then sit in a, in a cabinet somewhere and not be utilized. So the shared histories, which is the name of the project, is, a, is an idea to uh, create a digital repatriation platform where we 3D photograph each of the objects and place them on a platform where they are accessed for anybody uh, to find. And the Amazing. idea of this is so that there's an immediate access to the objects, but also the users are able to, you know, functionalize these objects and that they're no longer just artifacts separated from their source communities. So we're thinking of researchers, we're thinking of scholars, we're thinking of artists, um, you know, we're even thinking of just any ordinary person who wants to understand and learn the no knowledge uh, that has been separated from them. So in a further way of actualizing this, we then worked with artists in residency to produce new work from some of these artifacts. In a you know, Samba, I'm, 
in a nutshell, I, there's no way to sum up such extraordinary <laughs> efforts, no. but um, I'm really struck by how you said, you used it, you said a very simple phrase, you said, we then, you know, followed up with how to digitally repatriate this. So I'm wondering when you say we, who was this we that had the, 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 the I guess, the courage, the strength, the imagination to say, I visited a museum, I saw something that was a part of is a part of my history, and now I'd like to move towards giving access to my community and my people, and access to that history. I, I'm just that's kind of a bold idea because I'm imagining many of us. I know myself. I have had the chance to go to the British Museum in the UK, completely overwhelmed by the thousands of artifacts stolen from the continent across east to west, north to south. It never once occurred to me, however, to approach somebody and say how do we get these digitally repatriated or how do we get better access to the communities from which they came? Where does that come from, Samba? Um, I think it comes from a number of places. I think the first one is that, you know, uh, we were in the presence of peers. The African uh, curator was very open and he has been someone who was also in the restitution discussion. So already that was an entry point and it just seemed very, it never occurred to me not to ask. Not to do it. That way? Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. We need more people like you, Samba. It's honestly, it never occurred to you not to ask and not to make right. a demand of exactly. the history. Exactly, exactly. Because I was like, there's no way after seeing this that we're leaving this here. No, that's not going to happen. You just, we have to find a way to uh, connect this back to our communities. And of course, we're very realistic. We're not saying like, we're going to get everything. And where we, I mean, where are we going to take them? I mean, even our right. own national our own national museums uh, lack the infrastructure to take care of some of those artifacts. And some of them are very delicate, like these exquisite leather cloaks that were made by the Northerners uh, with like very delicate etching on it, never seen before. Like it's only the Swedish museum that has it. We don't even have a trace of any of them. Even if you go back to that source community, they have lost all trace of that uh, knowledge wow. uh, and those artifacts and they're there in the Swedish museum and there was no way we we're gonna risk you know uh, disintegrating such valuable artifacts so it was we were very aware that it would be a long discussion but it would have to start at different levels and different phases um, and the most obvious one was the digital repatriation um, and that's how we decided. And when I say we, we co-founded the museum with Ramalenga Kapoor, I mentioned her earlier, but also we've, we've kind of built an army of African and Zambian scholars and Zambian museum experts who have started to understand that, yeah, we need to pivot and focus on indigenous knowledge systems because obviously they have also been following this westernized idea of museum making. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there has been recent discussion as well around this term indigenous. Uh, I worked for some years in the environmental space around land acquisition and land ownership. And there's this movement to like let the indigenous communities, you know, be the leaders and the decision makers around land rights. And I have to chuckle at times when people call the people on the ground indigenous because it's like, but they were here. This is their home. In fact, we need a name for you rather than right, you know, exactly. the, the communities here, which, which really brings me to another concept that you have been really focusing on, which I think is similarly in this, of the same vein of this idea of knowledge uh, creation and knowledge production, who's creating the knowledge, who's creating the language that we're, we're using. You have created this archive of stories called the leading ladies, which I think is just beautiful. I've just spent some time just going through one by one by one. So tell us a little bit about this knowledge production that you've created, focusing on the leading ladies of our history. Mm. So leading ladies um, was a very interesting uh, concept because we had 
these narratives that were obscured as a result of the colonial experience and destruction. So to give a bit of context, when uh, colonialism came with the Christianizing um, efforts, they went into communities and they intended to convert the communities to Christianity so that they can let go of their own indigenous kind of systems and they can control them. So one of the things that they came across when they came into our communities was that there were women leaders, you know, there were women chiefs, uh, women who are head of households, women who till the land, who own land. And for them immediately, you know, at that time, women were never assigned any positions of leadership, women never assigned land. So they removed that provision from the system and would never document any women leaders. So they were completely left out of the colonial documents. And interestingly enough, the systems that they used was what was adopted. Even now, if you go into institutions, we still use the colonial way of documenting information. And if you look at the footnotes and other documents, that's where you see some other references to women leaders, but they were never recognized, right? So hmm. when we came across the narratives, we were like, um, okay, so there is there is something that we need to dispel. There is There's an inaccuracy that we need to correct around our idea of women leadership. Because I mean, we've, for the last 50 years that Zambia has had independence, we've had general, decade after decade of international organizations coming in to teach us how to allow women to be leaders because we don't know how to do that. Like we oppress women and we sideline women and we, you know, and you know, this begs the question is like, so where does this come from? If in our history, we had women leaders and, and, and most of our societies are matriarchal and matrilineal. So which means the power lies in, in the women and, and some of our societies still hold uh, that system of knowledge. So leading ladies was a way to kind of bring that narrative back into the center, centering the conversation around women leadership that is not new, um, and also packaging it in a way that is bite-sized, that is easy to digest, that we could disseminate across many different demographics. And it worked really well. Um, it was an experiment. It was our flagship project. And we didn't know whether it was gonna take or not, but it was like incredible. Like the response was really great. And so far we've had a combined viewership of 1 million on Facebook because it launches on Facebook. That's when we take it to the other platforms. Yeah, no, it's, a, it's incredible. I'm, and I, I, we will link all of that information in the show notes today because it's still accessible to people. They can get it on YouTube and through yeah. your website, uh, the, the Museum of Women's History, they can access all of these incredible exhibits. So, you know, this idea that our societies and our culture were matriarchal, that there were women in power, your argument is that, that this is how we were and there were disruptions. I think that word is really a, an important mm -hmm. one, that there were disruptions to that system that we have now had to counteract. And I, your work is, is another disruption to these stories that we don't have. And so thank you for disrupting us and our thinking and our, and our memories. Um, I talked to a professor once who talked about the democratization of memory and exactly. how as Africans, we must go back and rewrite our memories because we have remembered things incorrectly. So when you think about the span of women that you have featured and are featuring on these platforms, and you look at where we are now, and we'll maybe just laser in on Zambia because it's, it's a bit unfair to ask you to look at the whole continent. From those leading ladies and other women in history, you know, who who do you think that we could really benefit from their knowledge now? And I know you, you would you might say all of them, but I would love to hear from you, those women who stand out to you, whose leadership we really need now or Zambia really needs now? I think for me, it certainly is all of them, but uh, I think for me, <laughs> there, 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 these um, stories that we see or the documentation about some of our narratives where you see parallels or similarities with knowledge that is now being taught to us. I was saying earlier that, you know, uh, these women, 
from these organizations from the West come and tell you like, oh, this, you know, this is how to make a, a, a woman leader. And I'm like, we already had women leaders. We don't, you, we don't need you to tell us that. And you see similar things as well. It's not just whether it's leadership, but it's also uh, environmental preservation or concept, the concepts around preserving the environment, conservation, agriculture, you know, invention, all those things were already being done by women, even health, you know, there were certain ways that um, women looked after their communities and, or kind of like uh, um, took care in terms of medicinal, herbal, um, natural remedies, all those things are historical knowledge systems that belonged to women that now are being converted and sold back to us as new knowledge or knowledge that is created outside of our environment. And we don't see that. We don't understand that. And I think that separation has been the most detrimental because we invalidate our own knowledge. We only hmm. consider knowledge outside of our own communities as valid. And yet it, it comes from our community. So I think those stories are important to remind us, like your professor was saying, remind us uh, of different things that we already knew that we've forgotten. Hmm. So from, from the women that you've studied and revealed, I think one of the things I'm struck by too is that if you are trying to um, excavate some of this information and this knowledge, like you said, when you went to that Swedish museum and you're seeing artifacts that there is no longer exist in Zambia, that even if you went home to where you're from, you would not find that leather garment anymore. You know, what one, where are you now finding that information and where are you gathering it from? So let, let me oh. start with that question, actually, where are you able then to piece together those memories and, and fill those gaps? Um, what sources are you finding and, and what is it requiring of you to actually create this living museum of women's history? Yeah, so it's, um, it's been an incredible journey. Um, as you know, in museums, when you go, when you find the artifact, they'll have like a statement or a description written next to it. Like, yeah. you know, this is a blah, blah, blah mask from Zambia. North origin, Northwestern province, ethnic group, whatever. But they won't necessarily have any other information around that. But I'm from the Northwestern part of Zambia and I actually have attended those uh, traditional ceremonies several times. My brothers went through the rite of mm. passage ritual. So around that, then it, it came to me like, wait, around that knowledge, would have these elders, uh, uh, we call them mandumbula. So they are the knowledge keepers. They are the ones who understand and know the knowledge of and the significance of the masks and the mask figures um, and the ancestral connection to it and the whole process of it. So what became obvious to us was that we needed to return these objects to the places of origin. So we took the objects from the museum and then went to these communities and started showing the objects. And we're very lucky. And I say very lucky because I think we have a very short space, a window, a very small window in which we need to document these histories because a lot of the knowledge keepers, the elders are dying. Yes. And we were lucky that we were able to find elders, some in their 90s, some in their 80s, who remembered what these objects were and they were able to describe them, what their uses were. Uh, and uh, most of them were, would communicate and, and tell us that they, they were made by their grandfather or their grandmother or their mother or father, and they no longer do the thing anymore. Um, Wow. So it really made us uh, very aware that it was critical uh, that we document these histories and we add the metadata that they were giving us to these objects to actually give them the correct context. Yeah. 
So it sounds like you weren't even finding text or, or you know, scholarly work that you could refer to. You were actually going to the the history historians themselves, the, mm -hmm. the living historians, and saying, "Tell us more about what this is, and give it meaning, give it context, give it understanding, so that we can now archive it and, and digitally and otherwise repatriate it." Were you just doing this through like a, a word of mouth? Did you put a call out on social media for people to help you? engage with this these artifacts and these documents that you were trying to then you know share with a broader public uh no luckily we were able from the artifacts in the museum we were able to pinpoint the locations so what we did for example like i said the, the makishima said northwestern yeah. province this ethnic group this village, you know, they don't have that information. So we just went directly to the villages. Um, we have an incredible uh, relationship with some of the communities and associations and museums that are in those areas. For example, when we went to the Southern province of Choma Museum uh, and, the, and incredibly there's a huge, you know, artifact list of southern province artifacts in the Swedish Museum. So we were able to go back to the villages in the Museum of um, uh, Choma and southern province in Zambia and visited seven, seven, yeah, seven communities there. And they were able to recognize a lot of the artifacts and give them the wow. correct names, yeah, give them the correct uses, the songs that were, you know, sung around them, you know, who would make, typically make them, whether it was a male or a female. Um, yeah, it was really incredible um, to have that What was the reaction of the communities when they saw these artifacts, when they saw these, you know, pieces of their story brought back to them? I mean, you really bridged the divide from a digital <laughs> platform to share them, but then having to do the physical work of just going yourself to take these items. I can only imagine the reaction you had from individuals and communities, but what was that like? It was really heartwarming um, to see how the expression on their faces of recognition and validation, because I talked about validation and, and justice for communities, because I think a lot of the time we assume or take on this idea that our information, our knowledge is not valid. But when we brought this knowledge to them and we're like, we need to learn from you because we don't know what is this knowledge, their faces lit up and, you know, they, mm. they could recount all these memories and how they used to do this work. For example, hunting in, in those communities was a big thing. So they would do this ceremony where, you know, the main hunter would be prepared in a certain way, would go into a trance, you know, and then all of that was a way of giving the hunter courage. Um, obviously, it's, it's something that doesn't happen anymore, it has passed on, but, you know, the hunter would wear these ornaments and to symbolize the importance of who they are and the knowledge that they bring. Um, and when one of the one of the community members saw this, they were able to recount the full ritual, like how it would happen and everything. And then who would go, who was allowed to be with him and who wasn't, why it was important for this. Um, and it was really, really incredible. Yeah, and all that is context that is lost when you see an object in an, or an image in a museum, yeah. It's really, really powerful. I, I, I know that your your platform is quite impressive, the different ways that you're putting out the information and the different ways that you're engaging with the community right now. How are you seeing Zambians engaging with this content, um, the digital products? You've talked about visiting the communities, but I'm curious, you know, what you're hearing from the online community or those who are engaging with some of this for the very first time with their own history. What are you hearing from, from fellow Zambians? I think in the in the beginning we thought that it was going to be something that would probably resonate mostly to women, um, but we're really intrigued and um, grateful to see that it actually resonates to all demographics: older, younger, you know, in between working people who professionals, working professionals, 
people in the cultural space, people in the scholarly space. We've worked with universities, we've worked with the creative and cultural sector, we've worked with government institutions to uh, influence policy around the cultural space, around the art space. Um, we've influenced even just ordinary everyday people. And um, I, I mean, we never ever imagined that it would ever come to the point where we're sitting in a government office and they're asking us, okay, so how we sh should we create the policy around A, B, C, and D? Um, I was just gonna ask you that. I was just gonna ask you, tell us a story <laughs> of maybe how, I'd love to hear both from the government end because we know at the end of the day, if some of these um, efforts are not institutionalized or supported by policy, you know, they can fade away, right? If Samba, when, you, when your work continues elsewhere or whatnot, you know, it, could, it may not, if it's not institutionalized somewhere. So I'd love to hear if you can share a story around how it's influencing policy and, and maybe a story from individuals who have really taken this work to heart. Yeah, so around policy, I mean, right now we have a new government, new, I say new, it's almost two years now. Um, we have a new government and they're uh, very interested in improving the culture and artistic policies and all, obviously culture, creative sector, all those are intertwined. Um, so we've sat on a committee with the uh, Ministry of Youth, Sports and Arts, to design a policy that will encourage more cultural indigenous, you know, um, knowledge systems to be included. Um, because Amazing. even now, when we create policy, it's still very much a westernized way of looking at developing policies or implementing policies. And we never really think of how it impacts the source communities or our indigenous communities or our local communities. Uh, so we were brought in to kind of uh, highlight and uh, shine a light on that aspect to see how that can be included. Um, so that's one of the stories I can give, uh, you know, and going for it. Luckily, our cultural space is still very rich. We still have a lot of traditional ceremonies that take place and a lot of people that interact and a lot of them, but there are spaces where there are gaps. And those are the gaps where they were like, okay, what can we do to improve this? Whether it's including it in schools or a lot, we've had a lot of universities also requesting for a kind of curriculum from us uh, that they can add and supplement along with the, the work that they're already mm. doing and the mm. teaching that they're already doing. So that has really been incredible for us. And then just everyday normal people, um, I, think, I think the one I, story I always share is the, where we would get feedback on all our uh, we normally get feedback on all the videos when we post them on Facebook and people are like uh, posting and even before they're out when we're sending promos they're like we can't wait to see what the next story is this has really changed my life I watch this with my kids I want them mm -hmm. to understand and learn that you know women are powerful but mostly the what surprised us is was mess messages and comments and feedback from men and not not young, you know, because the younger ones, there's there's more hope. They're much more <laughs> enlightened. Yes. <laughs> I, you know, like age group from 40 going up, men, you know, going like, you know, if I had known this about like, well, first of all, why wasn't this taught to us in school? Second, if this is something I knew about women, I would think of women in a different way. That I thought that was wow. really powerful for me. Yeah. That was really powerful mm. for me because it said so much about how this person interacts with women and his perception of women because of yeah. his historical experience of understanding what a Zambian woman was. Of that was course. crazy. It was crazy to yeah. Me. yeah. I mean, if you look at, if you're only ever taught that women serve a particular role, a particular function, if women are completely absent from conversations around medicine or architecture or engineering, 
and you only ever have an encounter with maybe your mother or a sister, then of course your view is incredibly narrow and, and incredibly. Exactly. Yeah, I, I remember for, for me as an Ethiopian American, when Barack Obama was elected, my children were very young and then he was reelected. And so for a time in their mind, living in Kenya in a black country as well, not in the US where, where my husband is from, they just thought black people run the world because yeah. Barack Obama is president there and we're in Kenya, everyone is black from the teacher to the you know the neighborhood guys so they're like oh being black is being powerful like that's the yeah. interpretation of identity now because that's all they see from the west and to the east so of course if, if the stories of our women are you know just encapsulized to such a small space oh. then our not only our men but also our women will will be limited by their understanding and and, and what a what a service this this museum is I, we will link all of the places in our show notes for listeners to Thank find your you. work and to engage with it it's so incredibly important and powerful for for everyone like you said from young to old no matter what profession or area you might find yourself in so I know most people must ask you this all the time, but I would love to hear if from the leading ladies that you featured or from the women that you have, whose stories you have elevated to the top of the, the museum's, you know, um, records and stories, is there one or two that really stand out that you think, you know, I must mention this woman and, and women whose stories may have surprised or delighted you? Mm hmm um, yeah, there's several. Uh, one of my favorites is Wendy Ango. She's um, from season one, episode 10, because we are, we are on our fourth season now. Hey, and congratulations. For, <laughs> thank you. For this season, we wanted to focus on uh, strong women leaders um, in from pre-colonial times. So these are women from 17th, 18th, 19th century. Um, who held positions of leadership. And Vediango was the chief matriarch in Southern province in a place called Shunganam Titima, where now everybody knows as Victoria Falls. Do you know okay. Victoria Falls? Of course, of course, I've had yeah. the pleasure of going, but I wanna, I wanna practice oh, that name. I have from, okay. yeah, from, yeah, I went for work and then we, you know how these uh, guys do, they, they plan their conferences right by the falls, but, but can you say that name again, her name again? Cause it, so the play, the, uh, her name is Vediango, Vediango. Vediango, Vediango. Mm. Okay. It's and the place is called? Soft B is it Vediango? Yeah. Shushungu Namutitima. Oh my, Shushungu <laughs> Namotitia. Is that good, okay? Good, that's pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, oh. And it's also known, <laughs> also known as Mosotunia. So that was, that. those are the original names of the falls or are the names of the falls. But when Are the they, names. They, those are the names of the falls. But when David Livingston came and discovered the falls, he renamed them Victoria Falls, but the locals, called it Shungunamutitima or uh, Mosotunia, depending on where you, you came from, because Shungunamutitima is, is, is Tokalea, which means a place that vibrates, literally. Mm. And then Mosotunia means the, the smoke that thunders, which the falls. Absolutely. If you've seen if you yes. the falls, Majestic. you know that, yeah, and, and that it smokes, that there's a huge water spray that looks like smoke. Um, so that's what Mosotunia means. So she was the, the guardian and matriarch of the Mosotunia. And uh, she had, she reigned uh, uh, a kingdom that was very powerful. And then a visiting uh, king came from the north and saw this place. And he's just like, you know, I want to be, I want to live here. And she was like, no, the only way you can live here is if we make a deal that you will protect, you know, uh, the kingdom from any uh, warring factions, and then I can give you part of the land to rule. So for me, that was the first example of gender equality, number one, and co-ruling, because from mm. that time till today, there is a female uh chief and a male chief they both still ah, exist yeah in in zambian structure society mm. yes yeah mm. uh, but when the colonizers came 
they refused to recognize Vediango, and that's how that knowledge passed out of our history. That's why we don't know. About, that's why when you ask anyone, they won't know about it because it was something that was removed, like possibly mm. removed. But the community still knows about it, and they still practice. Um, they, she's still their leader. So that's one of my favorite stories because I was like, that's a clear example of gender equality to me and women leadership. Absolutely. So I don't know what we talk about when they're like, oh, Africans <laughs> don't have women. Leaders. I love it. That's one of yeah. that's one of my favorite. Uh, another one, I think, uh, one other one is um, from season two, I think, uh, and her name is Namwezi, and Namwezi, Namwezi. was an eighteen-year-old freedom fighter. So she actually, yeah, she actually was the instigator of a lot of uh, sabotage missions uh, that were instructed by our freedom fighters. And at 18 year, years old, she worked with leaders like KK, Changufu, all these kind of people who, you know, like the cream of the crop of the liberation struggle mm. to organize these uh, sabotage attacks, but she was killed. Mm. She was betrayed by one of her team members and mm. killed uh, at the mm. very young age of 18 during one of um, her saboteur missions. She, yeah, she's, wow. she's very inspiring to me. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. so there are many. I mean, they, they, when you tell their stories immediately, if, it makes me think that if you grow up with their stories in your history, in your DNA, how you would view yourself differently, how courage would just, you would feel like that's a part of who you are if, if these stories were the ones that you grew up on. And so how wonderful that there is going to be a generation that is going to grow up with their stories as available to them as, you know, math and architecture, everything else that we mentioned earlier. And, and thank you for that. I, I wanna just ask as we close up, do, do you feel like the, the work that you're doing in Zambia around this digital access, around women's history, around knowledge production, do you think it can scale beyond Zambia? And what would that take? And what are you seeing perhaps in other countries that excites you around this access to knowledge? Yeah. I think it de can definitely scale. I mean, we're doing work as so leading ladies who've done a Malawi and Zimbabwe and South Africa version. Um, Fabulous. So, yeah, so uh, we definitely wanted to scale. But I think one of the most important things for us, what we've realized is ensuring that African scholarly work focuses and recenters indigenous knowledge systems because having worked in the last in the last two years as the space that I've been in and we've realized that scholarly work is very competitive and African scholars in order to be competitive you will often find that they are forced to do work that is subscribed or that is prescribed by western you know, uh, scholarly subjects so that they can be able to do scholarly work. Because when they present mm. things like indigenous, indigenous knowledge, uh, provenance research, community sources, it's not popular, it's mm. not sexy. It's just like, you know, yeah. nobody, nobody's gonna fund it. And unfortunately, it's so competitive. The funding is heavily uh, centered in the Western scholarly space that African scholars are forced to write subjects that they might not really advocate for indigenous knowledge. So we've been working to kind of like encourage that more. And luckily it's at the right time because restitution brings about the question of scholarly work because mm. previously all the scholars who'd write about this restitution, the objects, the artifacts, it was very Eurocentric very Eurocentered, looking at the anthropological history, what the benefit is for the museums, completely leaving out the source communities. And now this is an opportunity to recenter now to uh, the communities and there is a tension there and we really want to push that agenda. That's fantastic. I the image that comes to my mind as I hear you talk is as a lighthouse, you know, on the shore, just putting out that light to guide 
the funding, guide the attention, guide the <laughs> rightfully placed uh, acknowledgement to the right places. Uh, Samba, it's just really powerful and important what you're doing. So I, I I think it's a good place to kind of wrap and pause and and reflect on what you what you've said today. And we always like to ask our two guests our guests two questions when they come on. You know, salam and hello. We really focus on stories of joy and justice from the continent and the diaspora. Mm. And the story of the Women's History Museum of Zambia is certainly both. It is a story of joy and it's a story of justice. And um, so grateful for the time that you've had to share it for us. So I'd love to hear from you before we go to kind of impromptu questions. First of all, what is your favorite drink? Samba. Mm. On this Women's International Women's Day, what are you going to be toasting yourself with later today? <laughs> um, grapefruit gin and tonic. Mm. Ooh. I'm enjoying that at the moment. Yeah. That, that sounds like refreshing. Fresh, yeah. yeah. Fresh grapefruit gin tonic. Yeah. I like that. Next time you're in Nairobi, <laughs> that, that drink is on me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And then finally, Samba, tell us what is bringing you joy? I think connections like these. I mean, honestly, the, the festival in Nairobi was just, uh, it gave me so much energy because this work is hard. Uh, yeah. It's, it's fulfilling, it's, uh, it's rewarding especially when you see the results, but it's hard because you have to self-motivate and you have to continue staying against the grain. It's not always the easiest thing to do because you have to fight so many barriers and forces, but I'm energized every time I come into contact with communities, people such as yourselves who are doing the same kind of work. And I read, I see something on Instagram and it literally repeats the exact same thing we're saying. And I'm like, we're doing the right thing. Yeah. It's validating, it's validating and it's confirmation. And that brings me such immense joy. Oh, thank you for that. And and may that joy just continue to find you and surround you and lift you up and fuel you as you continue to do this work that all of us are benefiting from. Uh, Samba, it's been absolutely a pleasure to talk to you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for the opportunity to share in your platform, to share our work and to share with you as well and continue doing your amazing work too. Thank you for that. We absolutely will. We'll stay in touch for sure. And, and listeners, we will definitely be linking all of the ways that you can find Samba's work from the Museum of Women's History, the Leading Ladies exhibit, all the many different things we mentioned, they will all be linked in the show notes. So just scroll down wherever you're listening and find the way to engage with her work. And of course, we'd love to hear from you. So send us a message. You can send us an email, lily at salamandhello.com. Or of course, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Salam and Hello. And don't miss next week as we continue to celebrate Women's History Month every week here on Salam and Hello. Tune in and be in touch. And until we meet again, take it easy. Don't ask me why I'm by your side. You keep me